Good afternoon. Welcome to Sophie's National Health Education Week. We're so happy to have you with us today to kick off our 2020 celebration. I'm Bridget Johnson. Excuse me, next slide. Hi, I'm Bridget Johnson, Director of Communications here at the Society for Public Health Education, and I'll be your host and moderator for today's session. Next slide. I just wanted to let everyone know that you are muted for the duration of this um, webinar. You have an option to connect with us using um, the chat box that is located in the bottom section of your um, screen. There will be a Q&A session at the conclusion of today's webinars. You can submit, again, those questions by typing into the chat box at the bottom of your screen. We want your feedback. Following the conclusion of this webinar, we will send you via email a brief evaluation that is, um, and you can just complete it and send it back and it'll come automatically to us. It's anonymous, and we just want to make sure that we are fulfilling your professional um, development needs through the Society for Public Health Education. Today's webinar is being recorded, and it will be available in the next two weeks on SOFI's CORE, which is our Center for Online Resources and Education. That address is sophie.org, professional development, forward slash core, e-learning. Today's session has been approved for one category continuing education contact hour for CHES, for certified health education specialist and master CHES health education specialist. SOFI, including its chapters, is a designated multiple event provider by the um, designated by the National Commission for Health Education credentialing, better known as InCheck. You can also create a free SOFI Core account at any time and access and manage all of your continuing education opportunities offered by SOFI. Continuing education can be obtained on SOFI's Core at www.sofi.org forward slash professional dash development forward slash core dash e-learning. C-E-C-H and CEPH um, fees do apply when purchasing the recorded webinars. SOFI's mission is to provide global leadership to the profession of health education and health promotion and to promote the health of society. I wanted to highlight the rest of the webinars that we have for National Health Education to week week. Tomorrow, join us for emergency management during the COVID-19 pandemic, again via Zoom at 2 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. On Wednesday, we'll have a webinar entitled Supporting Employee Mental Health and Well-Being During COVID-19, again 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time via Zoom. All of this information is located on our SOFI website, www.sofi.org. Thursday, join us. I'll be here again as your host and moderator for Health Literacy, Words Matter. And then Friday, we conclude our celebration for National Health Education Week with a snapshot of health education and promotion career settings. Again, 2 o'clock p.m. via Zoom. You may register for any of these upcoming webinars this week at www.sofi.org. Join us for SOFI 2020, our digital experience, which is our 2021 um, annual conference. It's taking place April 6th through 9th. Stay tuned for more information. We also concluded our 22nd annual advocacy summit last week. Those sessions are now on demand via SOFI's core, our e-learning portal. Now, 
It gives me great pleasure to introduce today's webinar speakers for our webinar entitled Equity and Anti-Racism Approaches to Public Health. We have Dr. Keon Gilbert, who is an associate professor in the Department of Behavioral Science and Education at St. Louis University's College for Public Health and Social Justice. Dr. Gilbert's research focuses on social capital, health disparities, African-American men's health, and health promotion and disease prevention interventions for chronic diseases. We also have Dr. Griffith, who is pre-recorded. He was unable to join us today, but he is a professor of medicine, health, and society, and the founder and director of the Center for Research on Men's Health at Vanderbilt University. We also have Dr. Chandra Ford, who is a professor in the Department of Community Health Sciences and founding director of the Center for Study of Racism, Social Justice, and Health at UCLA. And finally, but not last, is Dr. Maruno Bruce, who is Professor, Director of Faculty Development, and Director of the Program for Research on Faith, Justice, and Health in the Department of Population Health Science and the John D. Bauer School of Population Health at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Join me and welcome me in our fine, esteemed panel of guests. We have a special welcome from Dr. Griffith, like I said, who was not able to be with us. I'm Derek Griffith, a professor of medicine, health, and society, and founder and director of the Center for Research on Men's Health at Vanderbilt University. And I'm also one of the co-editors of Racism, Science, and Tools for the Public Health Professional. And um, you have the treat of hearing from my co-editors, um, Dr. Chandra Ford, Dr. Marina Bruce and Dr. Keon Gilbert in this session. Unfortunately, I won't be able to join you in person, but I did want to at least offer my welcome. And um, my task here is going to be to offer a few questions that they will then grapple with during the course of the session. Um, I do want to give a little bit of background about the book itself. Um, and it just kind of speaks to the time and the moment that we're in. Um, the book was actually um, it came out about essentially because APHA Press really asked for it. Um, APHA um, Press had been working together for a while and they were um, having some meetings about what were some of the things that they needed to um, look for or that needed to be in the field. And this concept of racism really uh, rose to the fore. And they grappled with, um, you know, trying to figure out who would be best to to put together the book, who would be the best people to organize it, um, and who would actually be willing to say yes. And um, long story short, um, it came to us. And uh, there were several meetings, both at APHA and ahead of APHA, and I believe it was 2017, when we came together with some of the leaders in the field to really discuss what the shape, what uh, some context for the book, and what the components and the structure of it might be but also to really get um, a charge from really some senior leaders in the field about what we what this book and what it meant to have a book like this at this particular point in time. And, you know, we've actually lost several of the key uh, contributors to the book and inspirations for the book since um, that time. Um, Dr. Bill Jenkins, um, certainly one of those that I want to acknowledge, raise up and um, highlight um, he played a key role in calling it into the Tuskegee syphilis study um, and in his role within the U.S. Public Health Service and U.S. Um, uh, US Public Health Service as well as the, the uh, CDC. Um, he was working in there as an epidemiologist and had a key role in sort of bringing light to this through that, his roles within the organization. Um, we also lost uh, Dr. Loretta Jones, who was a key factor in really um, from a community standpoint, but we're, I'm Derek Griffith, a professor of medicine, health, and society. Okay, thank you. I'm so sorry you couldn't be with us, Dr. Griffith. But we're gonna do this 
today's webinar as a Q&A between questions that Dr. Griffith has proposed and then amongst our esteemed panelists. So let's get started. Again, if you have a particular question at any time during this webinar, please put it in your chat, type it in your chat box, and we will get to you with the Q&A session near the end of this webinar. So I'm going to start out today. What are some of the ways that you think we, as a field, can honor their sacrifice and move the field forward? I'm going to pose that first question to Dr. Ford. So my first question for the group is really, um, certainly, um, as I mentioned in the introduction, many public health scholars and activists have sacrificed a lot to be at a moment where we could actually talk about racism in a public health context and have it be seriously considered as a public health issue. So what are some ways that you think we as a field can honor their sacrifice and move the field forward? This is such an important question. For us, we early on with this book intended to name the book after a conference that um, elders, including Bill Jenkins, and actually led by Dr. Bill Jenkins, um, had had in 1991. And the name of that conference is, um, is it race or racism? Essentially, I may have the wording a little bit off, but and we wanted to name this book, Is It Race or Racism, to really pay homage to the work that others have done um, before us. Importantly, because at least for me, so much of what I hear and what I had been hearing about racism being a public health issue or about addressing racism through, for instance, social determinants of health work or social epidemiology really lack that historical context that made it possible to see that we who are doing this work today, naming racism explicitly, are only able to do it because others did work that did not allow them to be as explicit about it or that did not look the same as the work we're doing today. So. I would say that the very first thing that we can do to honor those who have sacrificed for this field is to name racism because that helps to continue the work. And then also to embrace boldness. And I would say not recklessness um, or irresponsibility or even self-righteousness, but rather a responsible commitment not to be tepid in a time when action is being called for. I'd like to add on, this is Marina Bruce, I'd like to add on to a couple of things that Dr. Ford said, um, not only naming racism, but also naming the individuals who are responsible for bringing this to the field, and also telling their stories about how uh, some of the challenges with doing so. Um, I, as, as one who um, has, studied the, has studied race and, and not only that, but also how race has emerged or the study of race has emerged in the last uh, century, those who were the forerunners also um, paid a price for doing so. And I think that uh, those elders who raised this um, at this conference in 1991, I'm sure, um, were not seen, were seen as being radical or rabble rousers in, in, in some way. It's important to document um, the history of the evolution of the discussion about race and racism in public health and name the leaders who actually um, paved the way for us. So I think it's not only important to speak it and say what race and racism are, but also name those folks who were who are brave enough to uh, talk about this when it wasn't popular. Okay. Um... Next question, what are some effective ways of discussing racism in the context of public health that you can offer to others working in the field? 
For all the benefits of discussing racism in public health, there also are often challenges. Many people still really struggle with this idea of racism being discussed um, in this way and having something very tangible to do with public health um, and really have a struggle with thinking about racism as a structural phenomenon versus labeling individuals or, sim or situations as racist. So what are some effective ways that you have for discussing racism in the context of public health uh, research and practice and that you think you could offer or that you can offer to um, others who are working in the field? Dr. Ford or Dr. Gilbert, you want to take the first crack at it? I'll go ahead and start. So there are a number of strategies that we can use. One of them is to think about the audience. So it's not just that there is a broad audience that should always receive the same message, but as many here and certainly health, health communication um, experts know and specialists know, it's important to tailor our messages for particular audiences and to remember that those audiences are affected not only by their experience or their area of expertise, but when talking about racism, also by their own personal biases or assumptions or feelings or opinions. And I think thinking about that, taking that seriously matters. And just one other uh, of many different recommendations I might offer is to focus on thinking about racism in terms of the mechanisms by which it might be at play. And just using the word racism broadly is helpful because it helps to draw attention to the ways in which populations are impacted by structural influences that are racialized. But to move the work forward and to get specific um, public health and health educators able to address the specific needs of um, various communities, it's useful to use language like residential segregation, um, implicit bias or implicit racism when that's appropriate. Um, you know, uh, the embodiment of racism and the effects on psychological well-being due to um, both internalizing the experiences with microaggressions that they have. So thinking about those mechanisms can help to make the term racism more meaningful. It can help to concretize what it is that we're talking about in any given instance. I'd like to add on to that. Um, thank you, Dr. Ford, for, for um, adding context to this. And the only thing I would add is that being precise in our language is really important. Um, you, you um, this organization has a um, seminar at the end of this week talking about words matter. Well, when discussing racism, words do matter quite a bit. Racism operates um, at multiple levels, multiple ways, and has multiple dimensions. And so it's very, very important to understand what we're talking about, to what group um, um, are we referring, and, and what's the context? So, you know, again, it's the word that's being discussed now is structural racism and how does that differ from internalized racism? We, we have a sense of what interpersonal, relate, interpersonal racism is, but we don't talk much about internalized racism in terms of how that can um, have implications for populations that have dealt with racism for generations. So it's really important that um, we dive down into it uh, to be as precise as we can when we're talking about it, which means that we, we have to study it a bit more. It's not enough to read a single article or even a single book to get a sense of what racism is, but really do the thinking um, around it in order that we find the right words to discuss it in such a way that we can have meaningful dialogue. I think what I will add to um both what Dr. Ford and Dr. Bruce have shared is um, really similar in, in many, many different ways of thinking about not only the audience, thinking about the various forms of racism that we want to address. 
but ensuring that our strategies match the sort of um, the outcomes that we're interested in, in achieving. And um, Tom Frieden, um, a number of years ago, had this health impact pyramid that focused on looking at individual level versus sort of broad socioeconomic strategies and their differing levels of impact on public health. We can really think about racism in similar kinds of ways. If you want a small impact, then you can, in, in many ways that was embedded in Dr. Griffith's question, only focus on the individual nature. But if you want to have a, a, a larger impact or more systemic impact, then you have to start talking about the structural changes that need to happen, not only at a broader societal level, but within our various institutions and organizations. And part of that is really focused on in increasing the work that we're doing. And um, one of the chapters in the, in the text by Nancy Krieger focuses on um, the chapter is, is called Why Epidemiologists Must Reckon with Rac Racism. And she offers up a number of different reasons as to why. Those reasons don't only apply to epidemiologists, but they also apply to health educators, those in, health, in the health promotion field as, as well, in terms of thinking about how within your particular roles, you can also not only acknowledge, but identify strategies to address racism. Thank you. Um, our next question, Dr. Uh, Griffith posed is, what does the concept of being an anti-racist mean to you and how does that influence the work you do? Finally, the last question I have is really one going forward. Um, one of the things that we've grappled with um, in the field is this concept of being an anti-racist. And there's one thing about looking at racism as a scientific phenomenon. There's another thing about how do you embody the principles of anti-racism and take that into your work, your research, your practice of improving people's health and well-being. So what does that concept of being an anti-racist mean to you? And how does that influence the work that you do? Dr. Bruce, do you want to take the first? Sure, <laughs> that's fair. <laughs> um, I guess from what I think about that, the, the concept of being anti-racist is understanding um, my role in uh, dismantling racism, both as, as, as an, at the individual level, but also the institutional and perhaps even structural level and thinking about ways in which those can be dismantled. And I have to think about that. What it means to me is thinking about that from the, from the context in which I work. And that's at, um, at a university and I'm doing research, but also thinking about the people that are impacted by it. And so there, there are a couple of things that came to mind with that. One is being intentional about uh, what it is that I do, what it is that I say, how it is I say it, to whom do I say it, but also a consciousness of, of the group, but also consciousness of differential power relations that are there. When you're talking with students, you have to operate one way, but when you're talking with colleagues, you have to operate in another. And so um, you cannot treat all groups or paint all groups or speak to um, all groups with the same, with the same, at the same volume, the same tone or what have you. Um, being anti-racist means being conscious, intentional, um, and always aware of uh, its presence, aware of its pervasiveness, and doing things to uh, diminish its, its power. I'm happy to... Do yeah, Dr. Gilbert, <laughs> I <can> tell you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I, I'm actually going to borrow from some of the work of Dr. Ford and our immediate, uh, well, not immediate past president, but one of our past presidents, Dr. Collins Arianbua, who um, took critical race theory and, and applied it within a public health context. And critical race theory comes from legal, scholar, legal scholars as well as some education scholars. Um, and uh, we're, we're very fortunate to have uh, both Dr. Ford and Dr. Arian Bua to apply that, to help us start applying that within a public health context. 
And part of that helps us to think about or challenge um, and understand the different ways that, you know, we, um, that our society is, is racialized. And even in some of the work that I do in terms of even thinking about gender as well in those, in those important intersections. And what it causes, causes us to do is to really challenge the construction of knowledge in a number of different ways when we think about our methodological approach, when we think about our study designs, when we think about the ways that we um, collect data, the ways that we train and prepare our students is really important for us to think about the ways that we can sort of undo many of those practices as a way of being able to really reconceptualize or reimagine um, what health looks like as a way of how we can eliminate um, health inequalities and truly achieve health equity. And part of that really does cause us to challenge um, the very ways that we you know, conduct and facilitate the work that we do. It even calls into question the ways that we construct our professional associations, such as SOFI. And the idea that we have to think about um, anti-racism and health equity all at the same time every day. And it can't just be the work of those, um, of people who, who, who have been marginalized, people of color, um, people who've been discriminated in a number of different ways. So you really have to sort of take those things into consideration. I had the wonderful opportunity recently to chat with some folks in Seattle about their use of racial equity tools. And the ways that they talked about the application of those racial equity tools that took some time is that they even have, for example, in some housing facilities, um, elevator repair folks thinking how the language that they're using um, in elevators helps to bring about a sense of equity for residents. And so when we can get down to sort of that granular of a level of thinking about equity and thinking about equitable outcomes and approaches, that's, that's really where we want to be in terms of thinking about anti-racism. Thank you, Dr. Gilbert. Dr. Ford, I know they've mentioned your research. Is there anything you'd like to add? The only thing I would add would really be to extend um, what Dr. Gilbert was saying, and that is so often we focus on studying the relationship between some exposure and health outcomes out there in communities. And part of what we are asking people to do is to recognize that everyone is affected by racism, everyone, not just communities of color. And so there is no context in which researchers can step outside of the racialized social context in which we live. And so we need to also study, treat as a serious uh, area of research, the, the context in which we we exist in which we as researchers do our work and the context in which we as public health practitioners, health educators, and so forth uh, carry out our work. So not only studying the relationship that racism has out there in community, but also studying and treating seriously and addressing the ways in which racism shapes our field. Thank you very much. So the next question we're, Dr. Gilbert Griffith um, proposes is, how should health educators and organizations like Sophie discuss racism as a public health issue? I know Dr. Bruce mentioned about, you know, speaking to different publics differently. That kind of ties into this question. Health education and health promotion, um, and this is why this is so critical for SOFI, and SOFI is really the anchor and the, the flagship organization for health educators. And so you're talking to an audience largely of people who are largely responsible for actively improving the health and well-being of Americans and folks across the world. But this is the area of public health that is really responsible for creating change in people's behaviors, in their context, and in their environment very directly. Some of the other fields are more indirectly helping to do that, but health education and health promotion are really about those on the ground folks who are doing that work and really trying to move um, um, environments, communities, and individuals to be healthier and um, have, live healthier lives. 
So how does talking about racism help us to move that agenda forward? How can, how should health education and SOFI um, frame and discuss this concept of racism as a public health issue? Don't be shy now. Let's give Dr. Gilbert a, a chance. He let, yeah. let, let him kick this off. <laughs> uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, well, it's a great question. And, and so I know some of the things that have been happening since the last um, annual meeting have been the, the kickoff of the uh, HEAR uh, task force. And um, one of the things that um, I know that they are really sort of paying attention to is how can you start to integrate a sense of equity within all of SOFI? And so some of that does require doing some assessments, um, some self-assessments of the organization itself, of the organizational structures, leadership. Um, and so that also helps us to move beyond just thinking about, oh, well, we just need to increase um, the, the membership to make it be more reflective of, of, um, of, of society. And so it's not just about diversity, equity, and inclusion, but it's also thinking about sort of how do we make sure that we fully integrate the experiences of people. So we, it's, it's one thing to invite people into our homes and to offer them a seat. It's another thing to just invite them and to keep them at the door. And so when we think about those experiences, we often invite people over and we don't invite them in. We don't invite them to have a speech. We don't invite them to have conversations with them. We don't think about how do we integrate their experiences, think about their needs um, within sort of all aspects of, of the organization. So, so it's really important. And I think the work that the HERE task force is doing is really critical as a way of starting some of this work that needs to happen within SOFI. I'll stop there. And let others jump in. Dr. Ford. I think it's important to meet people where they are. Um, some people are interested in addressing racism because they have personal experiences and they have seen and observed the ways in which racism is real and affects people's lives in real ways. Other people are interested because, you know, it's, it's trendy or everyone's talking about it, but they don't really have any true connection to racism as a public health issue. Um, some people are interested because they think, hmm, I'm, I have certain kinds of skills and methods or other resources that I can apply to many problems. I wonder if I could apply it to this problem of racism. But so the reason, the motivations for being involved in this work are not going to be the same for everyone. And I don't think we need everyone to have the same motivation. I think that the work can be advanced in ways that benefit our community and move us toward equity by drawing on the strengths that people have to contribute to the work. So I would say one way to talk about racism as a public health issue is to use the language of our subspecialty areas and so forth to frame the opportunities for engagement and involvement with racism work. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ford. Dr. Bruce, did you have any remarks? Yeah, just just a couple. Um, and this is to highlight what my um, other colleagues have said is in talking about racism as a public issue, public health issue is also uh, discussing racism is um, woven into the fabric of the very context in which we exist. It's, it is a public health issue, indeed, but it's also a societal issue as well. And so uh, for example, the public health uh, workforce is being deployed um, now to deal with the um, COVID-19 crisis as well it should. Public health um, professionals should be at the forefront of this um, and be not only now, but 
um, going forward in terms of being um, um, being able to respond to various threats to health and, and well-being of, of the general society or populations across the board and understanding how racism has sort of shaped that while we see those differences within population. So it's really, really important um, to uh, discuss this as a societal issue in such a way that it creates the context um, for many of the issues that we deal with, but also can be part of having this context in mind can give, um, can pave the way for others to come up with anti-racist solutions as well. So it's important to have that top of mind, um, not necessarily everyone has to be, have dismantling racism as their top priority, but they have to have a consciousness of it in order to uh, be more effective in their roles as public health practitioners. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to deviate just for a second. We had a question come in, and it's around the session title. You know, is there some intentionality when we say anti-racism and equity? Um, are they different efforts and ends? When we put the and between anti-racism and equity. I'll take a shot at that. Um, they are different. They, of course, they overlap. Um, um, but they also can operate in a vacuum. And what we want to, what I would see in that and how I see that is that um, anti-racism is steps that people can take or things that people can do in order to promote health equity. Um, just because you operate in, in a given way does not mean that you are promoting something. It's important that you have that in mind. And, and by having health equity in mind, you have to have a sense of what, that, what does that look like? And so how do we operate in an anti-racist way to get to that point of health equity? Thank you, Dr. Bruce. Okay, we're going to go back to Dr. Griffith now with this next question. How would you think about the way racism is unique to a specific population, and how can we address it? Now, you all come at this conversation around racism from very different perspectives, and you, while you have um, a lot of similarities as scholars, you also come at this with some differences. So what are some particular things that you could talk about um, so that we don't just think about racism as sort of just a singular concept, but the one that has implications, while it is a singular concept, it definitely has implications and looks different for specific groups. So could you talk a bit about um, a particular population of your choosing and how you see thinking about racism through that lens and through that population would be particularly helpful. So concretely, what I'm asking is how would you think about the ways that racism is unique to a specific population and how might we better address the health and well-being of that population by considering racism through that specific lens? Dr. Ford, you come at it from a couple of different perspectives. Would you like to Take the first shot at Okay. I am actually going to uh, take Dr. Griffith's charge and try to talk about more than one group at a time. So I believe that race, I, I tend to think of, I tend to use the wording of racialization rather than racism many times in order to draw attention to the structural ways in which racism is at work, and also to draw attention to the fact that all of us are affected by this racialization. And so the question then is not merely how does racism affect me or my group, but rather it's about the myriad of ways in which we're all interacting within the, uh, the, the air of, of racialization and structured by it. There's a notion that all groups, quote unquote, people of color are affected in essentially parallel ways. The one point I will just highlight here is that 
there are, in fact, ways in which the interests of one group um, contradict um, and challenge the interests and wishes and desires of other groups. Um, and it's not necessary to collapse them all in order to reach some sort of um, agreed upon sort of unifying one dimensional answer. So for instance, um, while on the one hand, many working through the experience and knowledge gained through the work on anti-black racism and the forms of racism that have emerged in the US based on um, an attempt to, to anchor race to blackness, um, emerging efforts over time have really emphasized the need to move away from tying race to biology, to uh, blood quanta, like how much um, ancestry one has from a particular place. However, on the, on the flip side, indigenous and Native American, um, Native American, Alaska Native, and other indigenous populations of the Americas have relied heavily on the use of blood quanta to meaning um, being able to say how much ancestry you have from a particular tribe as a way of ensuring that the people who claim to be members of a community or a population really are. Also thinking about the interests of indigenous populations, and I'm using that term here to refer to Native Americans and other um, persons that we might call First Nations persons of the Americas, um, also are not necessarily comfortable seeing themselves primarily through a racial lens, even though many of us who are doing anti-racism work include indigenous populations as part of the collective of people we call people of color or something like that. So there are opportunities for collaboration and collective work there, but there are also some important distinctions that I think should not, that are not, it's not helpful to obscure um, in order to advance a cause that, that, would, that would require us to sort of obscure differences in order to gain a sort of superficial um, alliances or partnerships. I hope that was, I'd be happy to talk about that further if there are questions. The only thing I would add to that, thank you, Dr. Ford, for that, um, because it, it uh, you know, what, what I took your comments to say, or um, it's important to understand the nu nuance is important. Um, but also understanding that um, what we classify as how groups get racialized is really, really an interesting process. And we can understand that by um, looking at how groups in, come into this country as quote unquote immigrants and how that get, can get racialized for some groups and not for others. And so I, I think we even see that now with when we talk about um, Latinx or Latino populations. Uh, now some have more of a racial uh, element to the eth what we classify as ethnicity. And it's really interesting in terms of how that works. And, and so it's really important to get an understanding of particular groups that um, one might work with um, in terms of understanding their history, but also the political context. Because again, let's understand that race and racism emerged as a, as a form of inequality to deny one group access to certain resources. So it comes out of that context of um, at a base level inequality and it has emerged and manifests itself um, in many different ways over, over, over generations. Uh, but so I think that understanding the nuance is really, really important um, and it's worth hearty, robust discussions at multiple levels um, of any, any institution that are training public health professionals, but also that are also those folks who are engaged in public health practice as well. Thank you, Dr. Bruce. Dr. Gilbert, did you have any concluding remarks on this question? Uh, no, I'll, I'll um, just defer to Wait my- Wait for the next 
Yeah, it, okay. We want to open it up to question and answers. I, I think we only have about 10, 15 minutes left. Uh, no, we have a couple more questions. We have one from um, one of our participants. And this is from Liz. She grew, she's white. She grew up in the South, but she doesn't consider herself a Southerner. She wants to know what concrete steps that she can take in her personal and professional life to help our society be more equitable. She gives us an example. How can she help reduce health disparities between white and blacks in the Atlanta, Georgia area? Other than educating others and living by example and educating herself and others, what other steps can she take? Well, since I uh, since I am on the screen, I will I'll take a, a stab at at answering um, part of this question. And I mean, I think Liz is already on the right track in some ways of thinking about um, the ways that racism may be affecting health differently for whites and blacks in in the Atlanta area. Um, and so the idea of sort of even acknowledging acknowledging that reality and that racism um, is an important determinant of, of those differences, of those disparities is really important. And so there may be specific areas that Liz may be interested in. And this is also reflective of Dr. Griffith's last question and the answers that um, both Dr. Bruce and Dr. Ford um, began with thinking about sort of what's the process or history of racialization um, that looks a little bit differently even in the Atlanta area. And also maybe how does that affect certain populations or certain groups similarly and differently. And so for example, if you're interested in a particular disease outcome or a particular population or even a particular segment within Atlanta, I would start with doing some really important research and trying to understand the nature of not only the disparities, but the, the sense of systemic inequality that exists within that particular um, either topic, population, or geographic segment of, of Atlanta. And it's really also important, I think, from both for, from our perspective as even um, as, as, as a group of panelists, is to even think about sort of not what you can do alone, but what you can do in partnership and in collaboration with those. And so there may be particular roles that you will have to take that are uncomfortable, unfamiliar with you, but also maybe sort of reflect on your expertise and that may be expertise that does not exist in that particular community. And so when you think about sort of really strong examples of partnerships or community engaged examples, everyone has an opportunity to have equal voice. And that's another important part of thinking about equity is that we don't come because we have a particular training or orientation to public health as the experts and we are descending upon communities or descending upon certain areas, but what are the different ways that we can help, help uplift the natural assets and resources within those communities to be in partnership with? And so we don't want to appear that we're the public health saviors um, descending into these communities to fix something um, because often what may be the, the opportunities for, for change may not always look like traditional public health issues or challenges. And so I really sort of, sort of encourage you to think about what those questions are, what are the different engagement strategies that you might think about. Thank you, Dr. Gilbert. We have another question uh, before we get back to Dr. Griffith. Does the fact that more than 80% of SOFI members, the fact that they are Caucasian, affect the way that health educators, as well as the organization SOFI, discusses racism as a public health issue? Yeah, take a minute. Thanks. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um, I think that that does have some, have some consideration in terms of the framing and thinking about racism. So one of the, I mentioned this idea mm -hmm. of diversity, equity, and inclusion earlier. One of the things that having a diverse representation within, um, within the SOFI membership is that it does allow for and invite or should invite other opportunities for people to not only be in leadership, but also for their voices to be heard. 
And so that's really important in terms of being able to hear the voices of everyone sort of in, in, in the choir, everyone in, in, the, in the membership, so that we can get an understanding of how racism can be studied or, or um, addressed, um, not only at the organizational level, but in the research and practice that's going on with, within those that are, that are part of the SOFI membership. And so I do think that it's important to think about where those conversations are coming from. And similar to my response to Liz, is that often, you know, people have to figure out who's going to be in leadership and who's going to sort of um, um, be, be part of, of the team in other kinds of ways. And to think about sort of what does that look like? What are the implications of that? And we often challenge people to think about that, you know, part of being anti-racism and achieving equity can't just sort of rest on the, on, on the, on the backs of, of those who have been marginalized. Everyone has to take on some piece or some part of, of this work. I think that I, I totally agree with uh, Dr. Gilbert in that. And the only thing I would add is um, when you look at the SOFI membership right now, it's also an, a unique opportunity to talk about race and racism by assessing whiteness. What does that mean? I think oftentimes discussion of race and racism often focuses exclusively on marginalized populations when in fact um, in this society we all have race of some type. And so um, the push for diversity um, also requires one to examine um, an organization like SOFI where it is right now. So if, if we want to be more diverse, what does that really mean? So in order to get a sense of that, you have to understand where you are now as an organization. And so considering whiteness and doing an examination of that and serious examination of that and working with others to unpack that um, and see where do you wanna go from there is particularly important um, in this day and age. Thank you, Dr. Bruce. I think we have one more question from Dr. Griffith we want to handle before I go back um, to our participant questions. And he asked, what is some advice that you would give to students who are interested in trying to address the issue and health implications of racism? And I lied and said that was my last question, but I'm actually going to ask one more. So given that we probably have a lot of students who are on the who are watching this and and going to see it or faculty or people who are going to engage with students going forward um, what is some advice that you would have for students who are interested in working in this area and interested in trying to address um, issues of racism and the health implications of racism going forward I'll go ahead Dr. and start. Okay. Um, and I'm just going to be quite frank here. Now that we are in this pandemic, and now that some recognize that racism exists and that it affects people, including affecting their health, I have been a bit surprised by uh, who some of the leaders are or, or some of the people who now are attempting to lead in various locales in responding to racism. And the responses that concern me are leadership responses that ignore the roles that people of color, black folks, indigenous folks, um, who've been doing this work for a long time have been doing. So I would recognize that not every faculty person who uh, is taking on racism now is necessarily an expert in that area. When you're a student, you go to study with the experts. And so do your homework to have a sense as to who's an expert in this area and seek those folks out. In addition, um, recognize that what you learn in the classroom is not ever going to be enough. I don't care what topic we're talking about. So in addition to what you learn in the classroom, particularly for work dealing with racism and other quote unquote isms, gain knowledge 
through your involvement in work in a community. Those are two things I would recommend. I think, Thank uh, you, Dr. Ford. Sorry. No, go ahead, Dr. Kilmer. Um, I think a couple of things I will add to that um, to expand on some of Dr. Ford's points um, to maybe say it a little more explicitly. Because you study health disparities or differences in health between blacks and whites or other racial and ethnic groups does not necessarily or automatically make you an expert in racism or racism in health or anti-racism practice. Um, also because you are actively interested in recruiting black and brown people into studies because it is, it is sort of that time um, that also does not make you an expert in the study of racism in health or, or, or adopting anti-racist practices. So part of Dr. Ford's comment about looking for those who are, who are doing the work and also even sort of cautioning yourself into engaging or working with those who are um, particularly new to this, everyone needs to continue to study and to think about this work as, as it is very important and the consequences of doing it incorrectly or engaging in this work inappropriately um, has the opportunity to further marginalize that work, marginalize scholars of color that Dr. Ford mentioned, marginalizing students of color and other, other, mar other students that have experienced um, historic and, and chronic discrimination. And so we all have to be very careful in cautioning ourselves in, in various ways. Um, I think all of us can attest to um, recently being asked to serve in particular roles or being asked to help um, white scholars in particular gain access to, uh, to black communities in particular. And some of you may have been asked and, and, and it's okay to actually say no. It's okay to walk away from those types of opportunities and to caution others into doing the same thing because that can have a severe, um, th those can have some very negative consequences into the work that we're trying to do in terms of addressing racism, not only as a public health issue, but also really addressing the issues related to health equity. I'll just add um, a couple of things, and this is at a very um, basic level. One is uh, for students to ask questions and then listen for the responses. And, and ask questions not only of those that are in the classroom, but also, um, as Dr. Ford so appropriately said, um, begin to engage with those in the larger community outside of the university bubble that exists. Um, and I would also say civic engagement um, in ways that you're comfortable, in ways that you have time, particularly as students. Um, understand the issues, the local issues are really, really important uh, because you can, it's in the local issues where you begin to see how, how race and racism play out in the, in the localities, in folks' real lives. So that's why it's important to ask questions of folks who are, who are in the community uh, but also discuss them among yourselves, but be available to be engaged in the communities that surround where you are um, in order to be in order to be advocates, um, allies of work that's go already going on. Thank you. I know we're almost out of time. I do have one quick question I just want to ask from that came in from one of our um, participants. What would you say are important areas for equity and public health to examine for community mental health centers? Any have thoughts when we're talking about um, important areas of equity between public health and community mental health centers? I'll say this very, very quickly. And again, speaking of students, I have to, I have to run and, 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 and work with the students that I have going, I have a meeting uh, very quickly. But what I would say to that is understanding when you talk about community uh, mental health centers and mental health is understanding um, how um, racism can amplify um, 
issues, both at the level of thinking about mental health um, at the institutional organizational level, but also for those who need those services. Those services are not necessarily readily available, but also understand that um, the need for mental health services um, um, is, pretty, is pretty broad and, is, and there are not enough of them. So when we begin to think about um, the availability, but also the accessibility of them, those are issues that we need to think about and ask really hard questions um, in our in our respective areas about how you know you know what's what's the level of availability and how can and can all of the communities that can be impacted um, how accessible are they and those are important questions that we need to begin to ask about any public resource but any but community um, mental health resources in particular. On behalf of Sophie, thank all the participants as well as our presenters, Dr. Gilbert, Dr. Griffith, Dr. Ford, and Dr. Bruce for their time today as we discuss this important matter. Once again, today's webinar was recorded and will be archived within two weeks and available on Sophie's Core. Again, we will send you an evaluation. We'd really appreciate your feedback. Um, to this webinar. And if you're interested in continuing education credits, again, please visit Sophie's Core. Thank you all so very much for your time today.